Dobrý jutro si Rima, som Saša Vrážič, spíšam sa len na to predávanie, či byť na Ingolskom na Šestčine. So, this talk will introduce Rima's automobile for those who doesn't know a little bit, then we will discuss what we are doing, meaning autonomous driving at very high speed, and how we are thinking to use the autonomy in our vehicles. So, uh, just let me remind you or introduce uh, you the story. So everything started almost 10 years ago with Matty in his garage converting the BMW, removing uh, the engine and putting an electrical motor and starting to compete with this car. And nobody believed it, it will work. They call it its a uh, machina. <laughs> and uh, but finally, racing by racing, little by little, and learning, he starts to improve uh, the motor, the electric motor, and win. He starts winning a lot of competition, and then earn some money and start the company. One big milestone was, of course, um, uh, the creation of the first uh, world fastest hypercar. The concept one. Uh, so you, I will not uh, read. You can read uh, the, the main events. And uh, today we are working on our new generation of cars. Is the C2 that we, I will introduce later. So Rimac um, is split into two um, business model. I would say one is the vehicle itself. We are doing hypercars. We try to do the best. Uh, in the fastest hypercar in the world and at the same time we are doing uh, components power trains so meaning gearboxes battery packs uh, engines uh, uh, and so on <laughs> simply because we started like that you know uh, Matt at the beginning didn't want to create a car everything by himself but he knocked on the door of uh, known what we call tier one, he's the suppliers for the automotive industry and everything was too expensive. You can imagine, for example, just a light, it costs 5 million euros to develop it. So everything is built in house in our office close to Zagreb in uh, Sveta Lidea. And then a different um, car manufacturer came to us and said, wow, what you're doing is interesting, so we want it. And that's why we are working with Aston Martin, with Jaguar and many others. We are supplying them the technology. Some we cannot mention because, of course, they don't want that uh, uh, it is known that a small Croatian company is doing the most important parts for them, but that's the reality. So, our new car, the C2, was presented in Geneva, motor show this year. So the top speed is 412 km per hour. And especially what is really impressive is uh, the acceleration. 1.85 seconds to reach uh, 100 km per hour. So that's really at the limit of a grip. We are not limited anymore by the battery power. or such, we are limited by the physics and what kind the tires do. See? So, everything is designed in-house, as you can see, the interior, everything. Uh, so, <coughs> of course, you have a cluster display, you have a central display, and everything. So, this is just to recall the technologies we are doing, so battery pack, infotainment, so there's a lot of <coughs> programming here and knowledge about that, the drivetrain, electronics, Autonomous driving, it's a new activity uh, since I joined uh, Rimac two years ago. So now let's enter in, in the topic. So I, I believe everybody knows what's the purpose of autonomous driving to save lives, to improve. Uh, when you look at the statistics, you see there's a lot of uh, uh, people killed in the world and so on and so on. However, it's true that uh, autonomous driving shall uh, improve 
the safety, but that's not the reason it started. That's not the real reason it started. It started simply uh, because it was a breakthrough in machine learning. Uh, deeply everybody knew, knows uh, about deep learning now, <coughs> I believe. But this breakthrough <coughs> gives some opportunities and possibilities. And then the question is where we can put AI. So you see here with uh, robots, that's one opportunity. But to make real money, and where is the money, is the automotive industry. And, but you cannot just say, okay, I will put uh, AI in a car. That's not enough to earn money. You need a new business model. And this business model uh, was defined like car sharing, car pooling. So you, <coughs> so you spend less time uh, parking, you need uh, less space in the cities and so on and so on. And then it brings the idea to go to the autonomous. And then all of the standing here works, of course. Um, so, for those who doesn't know, you probably heard about uh, some levels of the autonomy. So it goes uh, from zero to five. Zero is you drive simply your car. One is you have um, either lateral control, other longitudinal control. Like meaning you have ACC, for example, adaptive cruise control, that's level one of autonomy. Level two is you have both um, uh, longitudinal and, uh, and uh, lateral control. For example, it's a combination of uh, lane keeping and um, adaptive cruise control. Then you have level three, it starts to be <coughs> really more interesting. It's a kind of autonomy where the driver should not uh, control the car anymore in some really predefined situation, like for example a highway pilot, but in a restricted environment. Um, level 4 is where we really start the autonomy, meaning you can remove your eyes from the street. That means, in theory, you, you go for example on a highway, the car drew, drives autonomously and you don't have to care. I mean, if you have an accident, the car should know how to manage itself. If you have uh, some traffic jam, it's the same, and so on. So really, you should not care. But it's still under um, predefined condition. For example, highway pilot. So it means when you enter on a highway, you don't have to care about anything. But there's a time you need to go out of the highway. So then, you, you need to be conscious that you have to take over the control. Um, and the level 5, there's no steering wheel needed at all. So here, it's a full autonomy. So mainly used in transportation. So, everybody is working on that. Now it's a, in the trend, there's a lot of money who is raised on that. And it's very difficult to compete, even for us as a small company, um, it's quite tough. Yeah, it's, we cannot compete with Remo, for example, um, and so on. So, we are rethinking what autonomy means for our cars and for the technology we want to build. And what are the challenges, technical, scientific, we want to approach. So. Before talking about this challenge and, and what we are doing, this is <coughs> a plan of um, the autonomy and when it should appear. So, about 2025, it's expected that a premium uh, car manufacturer uh, launch a level 4 car. Audi already released a level 3, uh, Audi R8, but they have some problems with uh, uh, legislation in US, but we can discuss it if it's interesting <coughs> for reasons uh, uh, later. The full market is closer to 2030. And then it's expected a kind of ramp up, but you have technical barrier. About uh, 2030, it's expected that 15% of market. Uh, of a vehicle and a soul 
is um, autonomous. So that's quite optimistic. And to reach, you see, it's not 100%, it's 90% in 2040. What does it mean? It's, we are not expecting that in the next uh, 20 years um, it will be only autonomous car. If it's the only autonomous car, you can think, yeah, well, maybe you can solve the uh, accident problem, but it will not be. So, but here you have some numbers, what is expected. So, for example, Germany is very active. Um, they will have more autonomous car than in the US. So, and the pessimistic approach mostly is that it will never happen. So, what we are doing? <coughs> so, we are thinking how we can use the autonomy in our car. So, you should know people who buy our car are not professional drivers. So, not all at least. Some are just buying it because they bought the Bugattis and all the hypercars that exist and they are just collect. It's a collection they have. And the others want to enjoy it fully at high speed on the track. But how they can do that if they don't know how to drive? So our idea is to introduce an AI driving coach, meaning to teach how to drive at very high speed. So here it's a chart that gives you a kind of uh, workflow. So you're, you come on the track, the car recognizes the track, and the track is already mapped. So we will map some, some track when we release uh, uh, the car, but if there's no map, you just make one lap to map the track. That's the <coughs> precondition. Then you have a fully autonomous tool, meaning you put your hand on the steering wheel. That's very important for cognitive aspects. And uh, you tell the car what you want to do, which type of uh, use case you want to achieve the best lap time uh, or drift or whatever and then the car starts autonomously on the track at high speed and you have some vocal feedback to teach you anytime what you have to do and on the steering wheel the steering operates uh, autonomously you will feel the torque you need to put and uh, you will feel the braking points acceleration point of the car then you can also practice the AI supervise you and uh, at the end of your lab we propose you some tailored training station. So this uh, training station <coughs> are split into two categories. You have a training station related to the track itself, how to achieve the best lap for the track, for example, but you have also um, the training station related to your skills, meaning how to improve your trajectory, vehicle trajectory, how to improve your look, for example, where you should uh, uh, look, and so on, how to, uh, to manage uh, the cornering at very high speed, and so on. So what are our challenges? We are 400 km per hour. That's crazy. And uh, so what does it mean? First, the car is very low and I will discuss the same part uh, just after. So about the visibility, using sensors is not like putting a sensor on an SUV car like uh, uh, BMW or, or, or so on. <coughs> so we need to understand the environment very fast. And that's a big challenge. If you are alone on the track, okay. But you never know can, what can happen. But usually you are never alone, and you want to compete against others. So you have really to perceive very fast and understand it. Then you have to plan the vehicle motion. Also, if you are alone on the track, you can pre-compute the best lap time and follow the trajectory. But that's not likely to happen. So it's very dynamic environment. You have other cars, so you have to update this uh, path planning all the time and the motion of the car all the time. So you know you need to know the vehicle dynamics very well. And what we want to do is to be at the limit of a grip. 
So that's very important. We need to localize where's the car, because if you want to plan the motion of the car, you need to know where's the car on the track. And at that speed, we need to be precise at the centimeter level. And uh, one thing I didn't mention is the driver is using the track as he wants, but we are supervising him. Meaning, if we notice that he's doing something wrong, um, if he uh, lost attention, if the vehicle trajectory is not good, we take immediately control. You should think that at 300 km per hour, for example, one second reaction is 83 meters. So we cannot allow that to happen. So let's discuss a little about the sensing. <coughs> so the sensors I think we all uh, maybe know about. So let's start with the most classical GPS, a sensor, global position uh, system. So you should know that it's precise up to one to two meters. So that's really not enough to localize a car. Then you can add another box that is called inertial measurement unit, here IMU. And this will improve because you have a kind of uh, uh, fusion of uh, odometry, gyroscope, accelerometers, and GPS data. You will improve um, the positioning, as you can see. Uh, the blue line is what can happen when you lost the GPS. And GPS and IMU, you, can, you are still on the road. However, depending on the price you put on the side view, if you buy one for 1,000 euro, you will still be precise at one meter. If you buy one at 50,000 euro, you will be precise at 20 centimeter. So it's unlikely that in normal cars uh, you have, or in cars usually you have uh, uh, so expensive eye view. So you need to find another solution. We'll discuss that uh, a little later. <coughs> Ultrasonic sensors. That's classical, everybody knows what is it. You use it mostly for parking. <coughs> so it's uh, an acoustic wave that it sent from the sensors and reflected. That's very simple, but usually it works at low speed, uh, not at very high speed. Um, a camera, everybody knows what's a camera. Here I just represent one of the most important parts. I mean, for us, the lens. Then you have all the digitization and you have a lot of type of sensors. Uh, um, so I will not enter into detail. But the lens is very <coughs> important because you will need to remove the distortion of the lens if you want to uh, estimate the distance of the object you detect. <laughs> Sorry, <I'm going> back. <coughs> so here, uh, the radar, uh, probably some of you have a radar on his car, so here is a radar mounted <coughs> on a highway, and so the radar the range of the radar usually is 250 meters, is what the provider tells you. However, it's with a certain probability. Uh, if it's a car, maybe it's 250 meters. If it's a pedestrian, it falls to 70 meters. <coughs> so, you should know that. So, if you detect an object, for example, standing still at 200 meters, if you're able to do that, and you drive I don't know, 150 km per hour, you might be able to stop your car. Not necessarily, depending on the type of car you have. If you drive 300 km per hour, you're mostly unlikely to stop the car. So our car uh, can break at a much, much higher level than the normal commercial car, but we are not at the level of a Formula 1 anyway. So, we are also using the LiDAR, but we don't want to use 
have a stand-up lidars, like uh, you know this um, rotating lidar that you saw probably in the Vemos car or Uber or whatever uh, companies are working on autonomy. We use a new generation of uh, lidars called solid states. <coughs> and uh, <coughs> there's no rotating parts inside and produced um, a kind of, uh, not as a camera, but a kind of good, uh, nice image. So in this also you have to detect objects. <coughs> and if you want to manage the traffic information, you need what we call vehicle to something, vehicle to everything, vehicle to vehicle, vehicle to infrastructure, to communicate in the city, then you will know that an ambulance is coming and so on, and you can manage your traffic on the city. So, <coughs> we are working a lot in machine learning. About, I would say, 10 to 15 years ago, machine learning looked differently than it looks now. But the most idea was the same. Well, simply, you have a data set, some images, some videos, or whatever speech signal, depending on what you want to do, <coughs> and you want to learn a model, whatever, let's say. And you have a test database, <coughs> some information that you didn't use <coughs> for your training, and you evaluate your model, and you get the results. However, before, in the standard approaches, it didn't work like that. You had to engineer features, for example, detect a pedestrian, while well, you had really to, to think how, well, what can be the feature that will make it work to, <coughs> to detect a pedestrian. So you had a lot of en engineering work to pre-process, extract feature, then to learn a classifier, for example, and the same on the test. <coughs> so it was really a high effort. And for example, <coughs> Talking about the past, to detect a feature, for example, pedestrian, one nice uh, feature was a histogram of oriented gradients. So you take your pictures, for example, uh, <coughs> some box, and you move it in all your picture, and then you compute for each block this hog, and you can see on this, let's say, nice pedestrian, that uh, you can detect, uh, you have uh, the orientation of a shape. And then you have a kind of vector and you train a model, just a core vector machine, and you get the result. It's a pedestrian or it's not a pedestrian. But that's pretty weak. <coughs> so here we did the exercise, and uh, for example, <coughs> you have a pedestrian detected, but you have also a lot of false positive like, for example, this bench is detected as a pedestrian. And this is something we want to avoid absolutely. So with deep learning, <coughs> it's different. The learning finds the feature by itself. You don't need to engineer it anymore. But you need <coughs> data. And data that you label. So meaning you put, for example, bounding boxes around the cars, around the buses, whatever. You you label also with pixels, so mean you paint every pixel <coughs> and you say this is a bus, this is a car, and so on. And then you train a model, and when you have your model, you infer it and you get the result. So there's a, a lot of way, you don't need to have fully, this is called supervised learning, you don't need to have it uh, today anymore uh, fully, but that's uh, the basics. So if you apply it to the same video, <coughs> uh, mostly you, you get um, not perfect but uh, very high uh, results and especially you don't get the false alarm in this situation. So why it's problem with false alarm is you can imagine with a car, you're driving 200 and the car thinks there's a pedestrian in front of you but there's no pedestrian and then starts breaking. So, how we see um, the general architecture and what we are working? We are working in four areas. So, the perception. So, understanding what is happening, what are the objects 
<coughs> and so on. For example, here it's uh, driving in Zagreb. So you have one way is to detect the bounding boxes of all the objects, pedestrian, to estimate their height, uh, and so on. But <coughs> even if it looks good, oh, that's not enough. And one important situation, here you will see as a pedestrian who will cross the street, you need to be able to predict the situation in advance, to be able to manage the speed. But you don't have the road, so if you want to see the road, you need to classify every pixel on the image. And then you can know, for example, where is your driveway. So, then we need to work on the localization. So that's a big issue, even in the scientific community, it's called SLAM, Simultaneous Localization and Mapping. And <coughs> for that, we use a fusion of stereo camera, in fact, and multiple uh, cameras, more than two, and uh, the, the classical automatry using the IMU, for example. And here, for example, you have on the top an image uh, from the left camera. Here you have a 3D reconstruction. And here you can see uh, the movement of a car at the centimeter level precision. This kitty That's a kitty level, right. And uh, <coughs> so that's good for benchmarking your own algorithms, yes. So, What's interesting here is that you just need the starting position of GPS and after it's an old way of navigating called dead reckoning. We need to plan the motion, <coughs> so that's, that's quite tough uh, at that speed. So we are working a lot of simulation and experimenting. Um, the video here you see uh, the red, the orange is uh, Shebal, one Croatian uh, known uh, rally driver, professional driver, and in blue, it's uh, our car uh, in simulation, yet uh, that performs better on a track. And one other important <coughs> thing we are working on is the driver monitoring, meaning we need to detect any time if the driver does attention, if he's too tired, if he's too stressed, if he removes <coughs> his hands from the steering wheel, because if something happens, he will not have the time to react otherwise. And then we take the control. Here I don't have uh, videos due to GDPR, so not a lot to show some videos here. So we have quite um, a lot of challenges. Still, sensors are really not perfect. So as I mentioned, the radar visibility depends on the object. But if it's rainy, it's also not working well. So weather condition. Standard LiDAR, also weather condition. I mean, you don't have a, an old uh, LiDAR that works under snow and under rain or fog. So with a solid state uh, LiDAR, it's expected to solve this issue. Um, the cameras also, okay, with a camera you can see 500 meters, maybe detect a pedestrian at 400 meters, that's a state of the art. Uh, however, if you, are, if you are in a foggy environment, you see nothing. Um, so, then sensors are prone to errors, so one sensor can fail. What then? So you need to manage a kind of sense of fusion that is uh, fail safe. <coughs> Um, so at very high speed, we need to work on more general uh, AI matter to predict what will happen in the future, to predict in short term and longer term what will happen. Um, also, deep neural networks are not safe at all. So using them in the automotive industry, it's still a taboo. People don't want to use it because it's really not safe. You change a pixel in an image and you can have totally different results. So we are working um, in some new type of uh, networks that can deliver us the information. In fact, we need to know. So
So this is about scene understanding. So how you can manage the autonomous car while this pedestrian is going. It does not present any danger. A human will understand immediately, but for a machine, that's really challenging. So about what I said just before, uh, about safety, our approach is to say, we don't need to know everything. We don't need to know everything. But what we need to know is what we don't know. That's the key. So if we know what we don't know, we can adjust our um, algorithms uh, to be less confident about several parts, for example, uh, of the sensing, and uh, it works much, much better. <coughs> then you have an additional problem. This deep learning is really, really take a lot of resources. So how to do that in real time? So, um, yeah, maybe I, I uh, didn't say, but you probably all know, so um, a deep network is a network that has more than two layers, and now you have networks with thousands of layers, and when you make the inference uh, of an image, for example, or a speech, or whatever, um, it takes some time to process. So it's impossible to process it on a CPU for real-time purposes. So you need a GPU. Of course, who is strong with GPUs is NVIDIA, you probably know. And here you have, uh, for example, uh, <coughs> some comparison between uh, CPU processing and uh, GPU processing. But however, it's very difficult to compute in advance what is the computation need uh, or computation power you will really need. In fact, nobody knows. What we are doing simply is we are taking the most powerful platform <coughs> and trying. And if it works, then we downscale. Because it's very difficult to know what is the computing power that we need. Because we don't have only one model. We have a model that predicts the motion. We have a model to perceive the environment. We have models to, um, of driver monitoring and so on and so on and so on. So it's quite difficult. That's why you need to implement on a GPU. And for that, NVIDIA created the language called CUDA, maybe you've heard about, probably. So on a GPU, you have a lot of cores, depending if you are lucky and you can afford one of the top uh, GPU. Um, then you can have highly parallel. Uh, and um, you can implement your algorithm in a parallel way and execute them on a GPU, for example, for stereo vision, it's very good that it's processed on a GPU. You take an image, you put it on a GPU, and you create a pipeline where you will process and compute uh, the different state to uh, have what we call, for example, the disparity is the depth map to know exactly where are the, uh, the distance uh, of each pixel. Then it accelerates quite a lot. But it's not enough. Unfortunately, even if you program a GPU, you may not have enough resources on the GPU for real time resources. And we are experiencing that every day. Um, so, you need to optimize the GPU. So, for example, NVIDIA provided a Tensor RT and uh, tool for optimizing directly on the platform. So what does it mean? You create your model. Of course, you should take care about several things before. And then you will optimize it. So for example, here you have a model. Uh, the input, you have some layers. So you have different branches and so on and so on. Here it's very simplified. But let's assume it does not run in real time. So what you will do, you will factorize some layers or some processing to gather them together. You will detect low uh, coefficients and you will remove them, so you will improve the speed. And also, uh, scientifically, it was proved, usually before all the processing we did in 13 points, 32 bits uh, numbers. Uh, 
and you see really an improvement without uh, loss of accuracy by passing to um, 13.16 points. So if you can speed up by two or by three just by doing that in your models, and you will not lose the accuracy. And if it's still not enough, you can go to what is called int 8, integer 8 bit. Then you will have a drop in accuracy, but you may have a chance to run your model in real time. Um, and one other important thing, we are in the automotive industry. So nothing is easy in the automotive industry because it involves safety of people. And you need to follow methodology of development. And the state of the art in terms of methodology is called ISO 26262. What is it? It's something that um, it's a development process where you have to write a certain amount of documentation, where you need to evaluate uh, the safety goals. So for example, you take um, adaptive cruise control and you will think, what are the risks with this function? One risk can be unintended breakdown or unintended acceleration. One other what happened uh, to uh, colleagues in Audi. Um, it, uh, so they had a function, on, it was on the Q5, a function um, cruise control stop and go that was activated. So the drivers use it in the city. It was um, traffic lights red, the car stopped alone, but the driver left the car and he closed the door. And when the car, the traffic light went green, the car in front of him left, and then his car started to follow. So you can imagine what a problem. So that it does not happen, there should be this type of thinking. So the ASIL QM means you don't have any safety goal, and then it goes from A to D, and D is the highest safety critical, meaning that often you need to double uh, your um, ECU. So that's very important. For example, in our case, we need to have two computing stations that run simultaneously. If one fails, the other is still sensing the same thing and will take the relay immediately. So that's easy to level. So it's very safety critical and you have a lot of work to validating this function. So, but also, you need a safety critical operating system. Linux, Windows, that's not safety critical. So, you have, for example, QNX, maybe some of, her, of you heard. Then you have very <coughs> limited interface or very limited driver. And you have a uh, hypervisor that provides the isolation between uh, all critical services. So if one service fails, not all the application fails. That's very important. So I think I'm in time to finish uh, the talk. So, Paravan.